Okay. All right. Um, okay. So that I wanted to make sure that uh, we got a chance a little bit. And let's see. We asked the students earlier uh, why you're taking this class. Did I ask you? Oh, you come in about the time we got to him, right? Okay. Back here. <laughs> Why are you taking this class? Oh, and I think I asked you that before, didn't I? Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll ask you again, everybody, two or three times during this class. Why are you taking this class? You know what? Um, I like your comment about wanting to be an engineer. Because obviously that was a ambition of mine, not necessarily from way back in grade school or anything else. I was raised on a a little farm in Idaho where I milked cows and picked potatoes and hauled hay and all that kind of stuff. My biggest thing was I didn't want to do that for a living, and I'd always been interested in airplanes and things that went on and. Uh, I went in the Air Force for four years as a technician, electronic technician. And I liked being a technician because I liked to solve problems. I worked on aircraft. And so when I got out of the Air Force, um, I went to the, uh, to the University of Idaho. But the thing I like best about being an engineer is that my job has always been fun enough that my wife will call me and say, aren't you coming home? I don't set, have to set and look at the clock and say, oh, I wish I'd get to 5 o'clock. I'm so bored, I want to get out of here. But it, I like to build things. I like to solve problems. And so that's why I wanted to be an engineer. And, you know, if you're interested in space and you want to, to be an engineer, now is a really fun time. I cannot believe how much the space industry has changed over the last three or four years. There's a conference that we go to in Utah every year, and it's called the Small Satellite Conference. And this year was actually the 27th year of that conference. And up until probably about, um, oh, I would say six or eight years ago, everybody that come to that conference would present papers about well, I, I propose to build this satellite, okay? And their price tag on this satellite was anywhere from 10 to, to uh, $300 million. And there's not a lot of money from NASA or other people around to build those kinds of satellites. So when uh, Jordy and I come up with this little satellite called a CubeSat, we come up with it so it was small enough that students could, could try and design and build this thing and get it launched within a couple of years. And the smaller the satellite is, the cheaper it is to launch. So like Professor Malfra said, we went from great, big, large, expensive satellites that, you know, maybe they maybe they'd take 10 years to build these satellites, and then they'd get them launched. But it was one satellite. If it didn't work, what happened to all the experiments on it? Psh, gone, right? So... When we come up with this little satellite, it was for student education. We didn't think about, oh, it's going to make a big difference in the space industry. In fact, when we come up with it, we were ridiculed a little bit. Uh, we were called dummies. There's no, absolutely no use for a satellite like this. Why are you doing building little toys like this? But all of a sudden, after a number of years, people started in the space industry started saying, hey, I can't get $200 million for a project, but maybe I can get or $1 million, or maybe something like that, and I can actually launch something and do something in space. I don't have to wait till I retire that my satellite gets launched, and that's happened with a lot of big satellites. And so all of a sudden, this thing has just exploded. Everybody wants to build a CubeSat. And so all of a sudden, things that you couldn't afford to do before, you can maybe afford to do now. Um, what did the Apple computer do to the computer industry? Anybody? It, it was disruptive, right? Why was it disruptive? What was the factor about it that was disruptive with the way you used computers before? Right, that's true. But it was affordable. 
right? It was a personal computer. How did you use computers before that time? Yeah, you had great big computers that maybe you had a, a line hooked to them that you could program them, but they were very expensive computers. Now, the Apple computer brought it back in your home and you could start doing anything with it. What about your uh, smartphone? What about the apps on that? Is there any apps on that that are you use? Do you use apps on your uh, smartphone? I don't have a smartphone. Okay. Well, do you <laughs> use apps on your not so smartphone? How about yours? Yeah. It's good, right? How many of you think you absolutely at this point do not need a smartphone? You don't need one because you don't have one. And you don't need one because you don't have one. But you got a smartphone, right? Would you trade him? Yeah. You would? Yeah. If he'd pay your bill, would you trade him? Of course. <laughs> but are you kind of hooked to your smartphone? Yeah, I don't think I would trade it out. Yeah, how about you? No, you like your smartphone, right? Does your day, is your day any different with a smartphone than without one? I, I, it is. It's amazing to me. How about the rate of communication that you get with a smartphone? You know, I get the grocery list on mine from my wife, right? So I've got to take care of that. But there's just a tremendous change. And building these small satellites has come at a time because of all of the technology that's went in the smartphone. How big were phones 20 years ago? They were bricks, right? You can't put a brick in a CubeSat, uh, how many of you know what a CubeSat is? A few of you. Okay, not everybody. It's a combination Peapod and Jack in the Box. Doesn't it look spacey? This is a pocket cube. Not a pocket cube, I'm sorry, it's a CubeSat. Um, we were, look, we, before we come up with this, students were building satellites that were about this big around, about that tall, and weighed about 50 pounds. Well, since you pay for the weight that you get launched, it was about $250,000. And that's hard to get $250,000 by having a bake sake sale down on Main Street, right? So the idea was to come up with something. and. You know, uh, Moorhead could build one, UK could build one, Louisville could build one, and you could all put it in this, and you shared uh, the launcher. Now, when we built this, y you've got to have some form factor for it. So I was trying to figure out how, I knew we needed a satellite that was about this size, but I, I, didn't, um, I didn't know what to use for it, so I went down to the plastic shop and I bought a box that Beanie Babies fit in. So if you've seen these Beanie Babies that fit inside these little plastic boxes, that's what we started with. And from a Beanie Baby, Baby box, we come up with this thing. And this Beanie Baby box was four inches, a four inch cube. And when we went to design this thing, I said, you know, um, there was just a project by Lockheed Martin and by um, JPL. They sent a satellite to Mars and they had a problem with it. It, it crashed, okay? Because one of them was using uh, metric units and the other one was using standard English units, right? So I figured, well, it's time students learn about metric units. So I made this 10 centimeters. That's a 10 centimeter cube, okay? And it turns out that that's just slightly less than four inches. And this size satellite, they have defined it and they call it a PicoSat. And they've defined the PicoSat as weighing one kilogram. How much water can I put in a 10 centimeter cube? One liter. How much does one liter weigh? One kilogram. Oh boy, you get more lessons out of these things than you believe. So that, you know, that's how it come about. But you know, a lot of these things 
kind of come about as jokes, okay? And so this is a joke to kind of put a little bit of shame on two premier companies, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and Lockheed Martin, that they couldn't get their act together enough to use the same units. It, it turned out I was in, in Washington, D.C. one day and meeting with a lady um, from NASA. And uh, they were talking about the CubeSat, and I brought this up and mentioned it. You know what? That lady happened to turn out to be the project manager for NASA on it. You know, and there's times you should keep your, your mouth shut, and that was the time, you know, telling, telling on this lady that, hey, I did this as a joke against you. She didn't take it very well, so, okay. <laughs> So this is a pea pod, and uh, we worked with uh, Cal Poly in California, and the pea pod comes from, it's a poly for Cal Poly, PicoSat orbiting deployer. And you all know if you have anything to do with NASA, there's lots of acronyms, right? So one of the things out of these classes and being here, you're going to have to learn a new language. You'll have to learn to speak in acronyms. And, you know, you'll get as it comes or, you, you know, you ask the question, what the heck does this mean? So, okay, well, let me, let me go on here. Um, I want to go through the syllabus with you. Um, I've got some class reminder things. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about work ethics. Got some slides to go through. Uh, show you about a little bit about what the lecture's going to cover, what the lab's going to cover about lab equipment. Okay, and then there's a new thing that we're just working on called the Innovation and Realization Center, and that's what we want to have you think about to take your idea and get it marketed. We would like to have everybody have an opportunity here to be an entrepreneur. We are looking for people who will get filthy rich and donate money back to the university. Is that a bad, way, bad thing? <laughs> okay. So let me, let me go on here. Okay, so we're going to go through all this stuff on the, the syllabus. And again, uh, I'm not going to go into it in great detail. And what I'd like is you to, uh, to look at it on your own. Okay, so uh, space systems engineering. Uh, systems engineering is the kind of being the engineer that looks at things as a big picture and tries to optimize everything that goes into the system. It could be cost, it could be size, it could be weight, uh, it could be power consumption and so on. So um, this is your introduction to it and there's two parts of this class. There's essentially, uh, there's essentially the lecture that you've got here and it's going to cover a lot of the material that's in your, in your book and it's going to be uh, with the lab. Let me just go on here. You can look through that. This is probably going to change, but you see we've got other professors in here that are going to give part of the lectures. But the most important part is really right here. Um, this is the, <coughs> this is the uh, credit that you're given, and I think I need to back up a little bit. Okay, so the laboratory work is worth 50% and that you don't normally get that much but that's really important here is to learn this and you can see how it's broken up there. Lectures are worth 50% but I don't know, have any of you ever had a class that you're able to earn more than 100% in the class? Have. Was it an incentive? Uh, yes. Okay, well let me show you what we've got here for you. We've got three things here that you can earn more than 100%. One is um, if you take during the term uh, the amateur technician radio license and you pass it, and it's really not that hard. Who's, who's done that here? You, you have? Okay. So here. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're going to offer outside of this class a course on it, and it's really not that hard. Uh, I can vouch for it because I took it and I passed it. And the time I took it was with a bunch of students. And do you think they were watching to see if I could pass the course? Oh, boy, that was pressure. So anyway, I passed the course, and 
so what we've got here is you see the scale of the grades down here, but, you, but you've got those three things. Let me go back over them again. Demonstration proficiency using a SolidWorks CAD program. Okay, that's the most important CAD program that we've got. And uh, David taught it, right? Uh, and they're actually offering one for credit, this, this term. So you can take it for credit, but you get dual credit on it, right? You get t credit for taking the course, and you get credit in here for it. So that's how important we think it is. Then there's another program that's going to be offered in the same way. It's called uh, STK for Satellite Toolkit. And it's, how to, it's a program that we can get for free. Uh, and by the way, you can get a copy here for free. We won't talk too much about that. Uh, but anyway, you can get a copy of this program, and it's really good for uh, simulating orbits and other kinds of things for, for satellites. Okay, let's see. Why don't you go ahead and, and go through that, and if you have any questions, write them down and uh, bring them to me uh, next class. So let me go on to the next part here. Uh, let's see which is that. All right. So let's go ahead and, and go through these real quick. What I would like you to bring to uh, the class each day is bring the textbook and to the lab, bring a laptop computer, uh, bring a loose leaf notebook, and that's to put this material in. Um, and a reminder that when you have homework or assignments, they gotta be handed in when due at the beginning of the class. Okay, keep your uh, loose leaf notebook up to date because you can use it for quizzes and exams. Um, okay, uh, if you come to class, I want you to turn your cell phone off and lay it up on the table. Um, bring a paper or hardbound notebook to take notes. And I would suggest you keep those notes in your binder. Okay, if you have a question, uh, please ask it during class. Uh, quite the answer, the, you know, it's quite likely that somebody in the class also has the same question. Um, class and lab uh, absentees or attendance is required. I'm not going to take roll, but if you start missing them, uh, it's quite likely it'll be difficult to pass the class. If you need to miss a class, let me know, and I will, before the class, and I will um, try and uh, help you make up what you missed. Uh, prior notice must be given uh, uh, for missing exams, and I'll let you make them up. Uh, homework must be neat. Uh, don't give me any homework uh, by tearing it out of right at class at the uh, beginning of class and then stapling it together. You're an engineer now. Please be neat, uh, and please hand material to me that you think uh, befits being an engineer. Okay, let's see. The next thing here I want to talk about is um, I want to talk about work ethics. Okay. So, what, when I say work ethics, do you think that only applies to your job when you get out? Or what, what does it apply to? What is work ethics? And how you feel about the job, right? Okay. Do you think the ethics that you had in high school was acceptable to be an engineer <laughs> out on the job now? <laughs> okay. If, if you didn't, that's okay. Because what you're here, you're engineering students now, and part of my job is to help you understand what employers expect of you. So, here are some things about work ethics. Being, being in on time, that means coming to class on time. Giving an honest day's work. Proving um, a completion of tasks on a timely basis. Uh, learning additional occupation skills outside of work. Doing things that need to be done without being asked taking leadership to get the job done, assisting other er workers uh, when your skills are better, teach new workers, be a team player, display integrity and honesty to the employer and to the customer. 
If you work for a company that's not honest with the customer, what should you do? Find another job. All right? They can put you back in an awful corner and do things that are not good, and quite likely the boss won't end up in jail, but you might. So you want to you wanna be honest with your customer. Do not do anything dishonest, even if your employer demands it. Preserve your personal integrity. Be neat, legible work. And some questions. Is schoolwork ethic any different than on the job? Should it be? All right. Uh, where should students um, expect to learn about work ethics? Here, right? Shouldn't we as faculty members expect of you the same ethics as we would expect of you on the job? OK. Will your work ethics be any different after graduation? Do you say, after graduation, my work ethics are impeccable. Before graduation, all I got to do is just get out of here, right? OK. Uh, what is your uh, incentive for good work ethics uh, when in a paying job? Right, OK. You're paying us, right? What should you what should your work work ethics be because that's you know when you go out you're getting paid. But here you're paying us to teach you, right? What should your work ethics be for the sort of thing you got here? It seems to be like there ought to be more incentive, right? It's not you're not getting paid, but you're paying us. So think about, hey, I want to do and I want to set the best example I I can while I'm going to school. OK, uh, what is your incentive if you have good work ethics as a student? Pass You'll pass the class with a high grade. And you want a reference, right? Let's see. Uh, who will give you a reference for a job after graduation? Me. <laughs> okay. I like to give good references. I like to help you find the best job that I can. Should I give you a good reference if you didn't do good work in the classroom? And you may ask me to give you a reference, and if you didn't do good work, I might decline because I will not give you a bad reference if that's really the way you worked. Okay. Uh, is it the faculty's responsibility to expect ethical work from a student? Yeah, I think so. This isn't high school anymore. Should the faculty give an, an employer an honest appraisal of students' uh, uh, class work ethic? I think they should. But again, if somebody, if somebody asks you to give a reference and you decline, what is that saying about your reference? Right. OK. Uh, what if the faculty um, turned over the student's classwork portfolio to a prospective employer? When you're through, what if I took your notebook with all of your exams and all of your homework and everything and said, look, this is an example of the work the student did? Would you be wanting me to do that? Or no, 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 I didn't do very good. But one of the things that you can do, I'd really expect you to do, what we give you in this class and 122 and other projects you do, if you put that in a notebook, nice and neat, and you hand that to an employer when you go for an interview, it is going to be extremely helpful. What I look at is I look at the things that you learn in class, like gold. I'm earning like gold coins that at the proper time when I go to work, I can turn those coins in for money, right? Why? Why can I turn experience gold into money? They want experienced workers, right? And the more experienced you are, the more they're apt to pay you and the more things you can do. So everything that you can get out of these classes, please, please do it. 
take as many extra classes as you can. Uh, when I went to uh, engineering school, there was two distinct groups of students. There was the group that were in the fraternity houses, and there was the group that was in the dormitories. What do you think that the, the students in the fraternity houses did most of the time? Party. Now, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but there was a distinct difference between the attitude of the students. Now, what happened to the, to the students that were in the fraternities and the sororities is they probably, they maybe made more money than we did, but they went on to different occupations. They went into being patent attorneys uh, and just attorneys. Uh, they went into other kinds of jobs, not engineering, because they were more socially adept, all right? Doesn't mean you can't be socially adept and have some fun at school, but it's work. You've got four years here. And if you look back on that after four years, uh, I think you'll say that, you know, I worked very hard, but I enjoyed what I did. I enjoyed what I learned. And it's your responsibility to come to us as faculties and making sure you're getting your money's worth. So, okay, that's the end of that. Let's see, what's the next thing? We got so many things to cover here. Okay, let's see, what's this one here? This is the work ethics. I didn't pass that out, but I hope you did. There, you can go ahead and pass that out. Pass this out. Okay, here's the, um, if you can find that, is that in the material that you have at this point? Has everybody got what's shown up here? Yes. Okay, what I want to do is to give you an outline of, of what we were going to accomplish this, uh, uh, this particular semester. Uh, we want to uh, go through the things that we did right up here, class introduction. Uh, the next thing I want to do is to give you uh, and with the other faculty members a little bit of the history of the space program. Uh, what was the uh, uh, what was the Sputnik? Does anybody remember? Okay, that was what was unique about it. It was the first one, right? What was going on at that time? Uh, there were two, two factions that wanted to launch satellites. There were the military faction and there was like a commercial faction. Uh, the military had probably the best launch vehicle and the best satellite, but they wanted to not have the military launch it and this was before Sputnik was launched. Why? Right. Uh, President Eisenhower did not want to look at space as being used for military purposes. So when the Russians come along and launched the Sputnik, he said, oh boy, they've opened the door. Before that, they needed to get, uh, gather intelligence on what preparations and what things the Soviet Union were doing. 
And how did they gather that intelligence? Spies? Spy planes? Okay. And they had spy planes. Is there any one particular spy plane that you remember? What? Blackbird, right? That same one? Pardon? The U-2. So they were flying these U-2s over Russia, and the, were the Soviets happy about that? No. They couldn't do anything about it. Why? No, they couldn't hit it. They didn't have anything that could reach that high. But what happened when they did? That the U-2? They shot it down. Who was in it? Pardon? Uh, Gary Powers? Is that name familiar? Yeah, it's a guy named Gary Powers. And did he did he did it kill him? He, he come out of it alive, and was the, another big thing. And <clears throat> when they shot this down, what did the United St uh, States say about? Uh, we've got one of your U-2 planes and a pilot. What did they say? Not ours. They lied. Okay, not good. And so they built another plane, right? Which was what? The Blackbird, right? And they couldn't hit that one. Why? It was higher than the U-2. Super, super plane. Really a fantastic story about that. But they, why didn't they use satellites? They didn't have anything. They were waiting for this thing. They didn't want it to look like military. But when the um, Soviets launched their satellite, that opened up the door for U.S. to launch satellites. The first spy satellite they built was a satellite called Corona. And it was really unique. How did it take pictures? Anybody remember? Yeah, it was the resolution on it, the best resolution camera that they had was film camera. So they had this big roll of film in this camera and they would fly over and it would take a whole bunch of pictures and then when you got through, it would clip the, the roll of film off and it would put it in a canister and they would drop it out and it would re-enter. How did they pick it up? Yeah, they had a plane that come along with a like a cable behind it and it would hook into the parachute and they'd reel it up into the plane. The first flight that they made with that, they got more pictures and more intelligence off of the first flight than they had collected at all time previous to that. One flight was how much difference it was with that satellite. So, you know, that kind of, what was the next big push? That they, that they came to uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States in the space program. Right, but what ultimately were they trying to get to? The moon. There was the race to the moon, right? Who won? We did, right? Soviets tried awfully hard, but that was quite, a, quite an achievement. So just a little bit of the history. So what we're going to do here we're going to talk about uh, the Sputnik, uh, the story behind that. I got a DVD, t DVD, and we're going to look into the space environment about satellites. Uh, we may get to take a trip down to the Challenger Center in Hazard, uh, and you might get to do a, run a simulation on their um, ISS simulator down there. I think it'd be kind of fun. I've been down and, and watched it. How many have seen the Challenger Center in Hazard? It's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool. Uh, I get to be in one of the one of the sites. You have both the the ISS and then the people on the ground, right? They divide it up into two classes, but they I think they switch you at some point, don't they? Yeah. So anyway, I think that'd be kind of fun. Uh, okay. The next thing we're going to do is talk about orbits. And then the next major thing that we're going to talk to is talk about is power systems, power systems for satellites, how they work. And we've got some solar cells here. We can actually bring some. Uh, a couple of things that I haven't showed you 
you've seen the uh, you've you've seen the uh, CubeSat. This is the next version of what I think satellites should be. Everybody else is going bigger, but we want to go smaller. This thing is called a pocket cube. Now, when they have this guy here, um, they put they call those um, units, and you can have a satellite like a piece of a piece of baloney. Um, you can either this will take three of them. You can either have uh, three of them uh, in there, or you can have uh, two that are connected together in a separate one. You could have all three, and they call them U's. And so this is called a pocket cube. And each one that we have together is called, instead of a U, it's called a P. So you have 1P, 2P, 3P. This is 2.5P, okay? And this is a real satellite. And you're going to launch one of these, right? You have Cohen? Well, we're going to launch one for us. But there's another one that's a 1.5U, and then a 1U, and then there's another one that's a little more than a to you, it's probably more like a three U. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, there's Cub Scout that's about this size, a little longer, and then there's fifty dollar sat. Okay, and then there's a one U, a one P, which is from Poland. So, you know, it'll be pretty cool. It'll be the first time they've ever launched. So, here, you can hold a satellite in your hand. <laughs> you can pass it around if you want. Okay, uh, but we start rather small here. Um, we start with things that look like this. That's pretty big, right? Here, hold it. Set it down. That's called a jiggy. And what what you're doing is just uh, just a little motor arm. But this is the first thing that you'd build uh, to to uh, learn to solder. And it's kind of fun. You get to take it home. And last uh, semester. When the 120 students built it, they took it home, and I said, I want you to bring it back because we're going to do some stuff with it. And one student come back, and he says, I couldn't bring it back. And I said, why? And he said, my grandma kept it. So <laughs> I guess she liked it. So anyway, this is, a, this is a jiggy. And then we got another little thing here. Um, this thing is called a cricket sat. And we put that on a balloon and send it up in space, and it transmits back temperature. So we get to have a real balloon flight. Um, we work with and do a lot of things here with the, uh, uh, with the basic stamp. And that's the kit that all of you bought. How many have not bought this yet? OK, this is what you've got to buy. And I guarantee you get a lot of use out of it. Okay, are there any questions?